All right. Hi, everybody. Everyone have, having a good day so far? Yes. Good. Um, so, funny story real quick. Uh, I came in from Portland, Oregon, and I left on Friday evening, and I got here on Sunday afternoon. And Sunday evening, I met with some of the other speakers, and uh, Spencer, who you all saw this morning, turns out we're actually neighbors. So, <laughs> no joke, we live less than four miles away from each other. Uh, and I've actually spoken at his meetup in Portland, which he was not at. So, uh, what a great small world. We literally traveled, what, 6,000 miles to uh, meet each other as neighbors? Pretty interesting. Anyways, um, okay, so let's talk about the looming complexity crisis. Uh, first, my name is Eric Maxwell. I work at Chef. I am a success engineer and also do a lot of evangelism when it comes to uh, Habitat, uh, InSpec, and other topics. This is my Twitter handle if you want to get a hold of me. Okay, so what do you immediately think about whenever you think about an application? So you think about, okay, we need to start building an application. What's the first thing that comes to mind? Anybody? Why? Why? Okay, well, that's a great one. Okay. So, so what you're trying to solve, right? And then, but what else do you then start to think about? So you think about the why, you're like, okay, I wanna build a thing that does X, Y, Z. What's the next step? What's the next thing you have to think about? What do the users think about it? Okay, what the users think about it, but how about even before that? You need to think about the infrastructure, right? You need to think about where you're actually going to build your application, right? So I'm gonna tell you a story. This is Jane. She is an application developer. She's very smart and awesome, and she has a lot of great ideas. She works for a company. And company used to be really, really good in their industry, and lately they haven't been doing so well. They've actually been slipping behind, and some of their competitors have been overtaking company, and they've been doing a lot better. They've been able to respond to market changes a lot faster. So, Essentially, they haven't been able to reach their full potential. Well, Jane, being the smart individual that she is, has a great idea for an application that they can add to their app suite that will propel her company into the modern age and will take over the, her industry and will allow her company to better compete. With Jane's idea, her, new, her company will be able to skyrocket and their sales will increase and everything about the company will be better. So she has a great idea, but she needs to build an app. So how does she build an app? Well, she starts thinking about things and she says, okay, well, I know that there's some technical, uh, some, some things that I can use, things that I know of at my company. Uh, we've got an app stack that I'm familiar with. There's also other people here at the company that are familiar with our app stack, so I can do that. <coughs> We've got a database, and we're all familiar here with the database. We can work with the database. We've been working with it for a long time. There's a lot of people here at our company that understand the database and how to work with it. Um, and then we have a web front end, which there's a lot of engineers at the company that are familiar with the web front end, and she thinks, okay, you know, I can tap into some of these resources, and these are all things that I'm familiar with, and I can start building things out. So then she starts thinking about her infrastructure. But unfortunately, working with her infrastructure team is often a pain in the ass. So she'll need to get uh, servers provisioned, and it takes a long time sometimes to get these servers provisioned. And Jane wants to be disruptive. She wants to move quickly. So she doesn't really think that this is a good option. There's also a lot of technical debt that's associated with her infrastructure. So she decides, all right, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so now Jane's back to square one. So where should she start coding? There's a lot of options. She's heard about this thing called the cloud, right? Cloud is awesome. So she thinks, you know what? I know, I'm gonna move to the cloud. So moving to the cloud, what does that mean? Well, she needs to start thinking about, well, which cloud is she gonna choose? Which technologies? Um, how is she gonna do it? So she starts looking around, she starts analyzing her options, and she decides on a specific cloud provider. So the cloud provider doesn't exactly have uh, an abstraction layer of the programming languages that she wants to use, but they do have a, a virtual machines that she can stand up. So she decides, okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and stand up some virtual machines that'll run my software stack. 
And they, this cloud provider, they have a database service. It's not exactly the database that she's familiar with, but it's pretty close. And you know, with a minimal amount of effort, she'll be able to use this database service. There is also a web layer. Again, the web layer isn't exactly the same web layer that she's familiar with, but she feels that it's something that she can work with, with some tweaks and some minor configuration changes, and she'll be able to learn the web layer and, and be able to make it work. So she starts worrying about other considerations. What other things should she think about when going to the cloud? And this triggers some memories from her, for her. She starts thinking about her previous position. And at her previous position, they migrated everything to the cloud. And at first, it was really cool. They were able to move quickly, move things to the cloud, um, and then finance got a hold of the bills. And they realized how much they were actually spending on their cloud initiative. So they got a directive saying, well, this is great, but you're going to need to find another cloud provider. Well, what that meant was 12-month arduous process of moving that application stack from one cloud to another because there were some technical um, things that had to be done that was very specific to the cloud that they chose. And now from moving their application from one cloud to another isn't exactly as easy as just picking up your stack and moving it over, right? So she starts thinking about that and decides, mm, I don't know, I don't think I want to go that route. So she doesn't want to do that, but again, she's back at square one. So she has to start over. So now Jane starts thinking again, okay, well, what else is out there? What else can I do? She thinks containers. Containers are awesome, right? Containers are all the rage. Everyone's talking about containers. Uh, why not use containers? They're really cool. So she starts looking into containers, and she realizes that there's depots that she can connect to, and she can download containers that host her web stack, uh, her application, and also her database. Pretty sweet, right? So within a matter of minutes, Jane has everything she needs, and she's off to the races. So this is really cool. Containers are a delightful experience for her. Super delightful. Jane's really loving the container experience on her development machine. She is developing like a rock star. So she's lost a lot of time already, and she doesn't really have time to spare because, remember, her company is not really doing that well in the market, and she needs to move quickly. So she starts, she dives in full speed into containers until all of a sudden one of her containers breaks. Jane wrote a function uh, that wasn't natively supported by the container that she chose because of the configuration, the way that the container was configured. So what does Jane do? Well, she can't exactly change the configuration, so she starts digging in and looking into things into the container and finds that there's a build file. Okay, cool. So she decides to contain, uh, configure the build file and produces another uh, Docker, sorry, another container. <laughs> container, container. So Jane produces another container, and now she has a fixed application. And now it's doing all the things that she wants it to do, and it's running her function just the way that she had expected in the first place. After, of course, a little bit of work and a little bit of wrangling to get that all working. Okay, so she had a small hiccup, and she's off to the races again. Albeit not necessarily as fast and as quick as she thought, but she's still off to the races, so that's good. So after this experience, it, it, it gets Jane to start thinking. She starts wondering, okay, well, I wrote this function and it broke and I didn't really know what to do and I had to do all this research to figure out how to produce a container that actually worked. So what other things might be coming down the pike for me? What other things am I going to have to start con considering? Um, so she starts thinking about it a little bit more. And uh, she starts thinking about, okay, well, what exactly is going to happen when I run my app in production? So she's got her containers on her development machine, and the more she starts thinking about it, she knows that when she goes to production, she's going to need a whole lot of more containers. So what does that mean? Well, now you've got a lot of containers. Now you're going to need some supervision to supervise those containers. Now you're going to need an orchestrator to orchestrate the inner workings of the containers and to respond to failures. You're also going to need monitoring. Do you put monitoring inside the containers? Do you put monitoring outside the containers? How do you handle that? Um, and you're also going to need service discovery. 
So as the containers are coming in and out of rotation, you're going to need to have some sort of way to discover that the containers exist and then to connect them all back together. So, whoa, this is a lot of stuff, right? So it's not just running three cool containers on her development machine. Now it's this whole other world that she has to start thinking about. And how is, how is she going to actually make this work? So she starts doing some analysis, and she starts trying to figure things out. And during that process, uh, she starts looking into the different tools that she can use for the different functions that she needs to handle. And what she finds is that there's no real clear-cut answer. There's no one tool set to use. Uh, there's no re really one clear direction that the industry has standardized on. There's, there's a lot of tooling out there that people are using. Some people are using some things for orchestration, some for supervision, some for monitoring. And so now all of a sudden she's like, what? This is not what I thought I was getting myself into. So now she's confused. And she didn't really choose containers because she wanted to think about all of this stuff. She chose containers because she thought they were going to be a really easy and smooth, delightful experience. So she says, nah, I'm not going to do that. Unfortunately now, though, Jane's back to square one. So she starts thinking again. She's like, hmm, OK, well, if I'm not going to use a cloud, I'm not going to use containers, no ops. I'm going to do no ops. So she starts looking into some platform as a service offerings. And uh, she knows that uh, she can basically, uh, again, there's a lot of different options for platforms as a service. And so she starts doing her due diligence. She starts uh, investigating, doing her Google Foo, and trying to figure out which platform she's actually going to settle on. So after some more time, she finally settles on a, a platform that she's going to use. She takes her container, she ships it up to the platform, and voila. It just works. Awesome. So now all of a sudden, all of her complexities melted away, and she's again off to the races, even going faster this time. So again, Jane has lost a lot of time. She doesn't have uh, the added uh, bonus of being able to sit around and thinking about sparkle ponies and unicorns and how awesome she is that her new uh, container is running like a boss inside the platform as a service. So she starts getting back to work. And she's like, OK, this is cool. I've settled on a platform. I'm getting back to work. And she starts writing some more code. Well, during that process, things blow up again. Only this time, uh, again, Jane introduced a new function. But because she's chosen a uh, platform as a service, it sort of works uh, in a black box sort of way. She doesn't really have that much insight into what's going on. She doesn't really, she doesn't really have the tools available to her to understand what's happening under the, the hood. <clears throat> so she, uh, she fixes her application and, and is able to get back. So, what she realizes here at this point, though, is that her uh, she's able to, to basically now she's driving again. She's not going as fast as she actually thought that she was going to, uh, but she's able to move forward, which, which is good. Um, as she nears a production release, she realizes that she needs some custom add-ons to her platform as a service offerings. She's going to need some data insights. She's going to need some visibility and instrumentation. So she adds all these things, and she starts running load tests. And her load tests don't really go as well as she expected. So she's not able to get the performance that she thought that she was going to get. So she started following all the best practices. And she started increasing and horizontally scaling her application stack. She consulted with the professionals that work as solution architects at the, her chosen platform. Um, uh, trying to dig into the issue, trying to understand really what's going on and, and how to make things better. But the issue still remains. So now, unfortunately, Jane is stuck. And she's not really moving forward at all. She's got a car, but it doesn't have any wheels. And she's really not going anywhere. So she's pretty much, at this point, out of ideas. Lucky for Jane, she has a rock star friend named Mary. So Mary is a rock star engineer. She's a full stack 10x engineer, works for a budding internet unicorn. And she calls up Mary and she says, Mary, I need help. So Mary comes over and Mary says, OK, I can help you. I'm a badass. 
So Mary comes in, she starts taking a look, but even Mary seems to be a bit perplexed at this point. Mary can't really figure out exactly what's going on, but again, Mary's a 10X engineer, she doesn't stop, so Mary continues, 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 and finally, she fixes the problem. So deep in the code base, Mary finds uh, an issue, she has an aha moment, and she's able to help Jane, and, uh, and they solve the problem. So now all of a sudden, Jane's car gets wheels again, and she's able to move forward. <clears throat> However, because Mary, again, is a rock star engineer, she started to think about things that perhaps Jane hasn't thought about. She started thinking about other complexities that might arise by going down this road and choosing this option. So she starts to share some of those things, and she lays it all out for Jane. So Jane works for a company, and her goal is to make her company more profitable and to take her Jane's new product and merge it in with existing products. That means that their company has legacy application, and the legacy application needs to be tied into Jane's new platform as a service application. So, um, and the legacy application runs in the data center. It doesn't run inside of the platform as a service offering. So she could try to move the legacy app into the platform as a service, but of course that's gonna cause a major rewrite and she can't do that. So, so, so in order for her application to run, in order for Jane's application to run inside of the platform as a service and to also coordinate with the legacy application, there needs to be some sort of uh, sharing of secrets and secrets management. And so once you do that, now you have to start thinking about security. And once you start thinking about security, now you have to start thinking about uh, compliance. So Jane could instead try to run her application inside of the data center, but remember there's a lot of technical debt associated with the data center. And also, Jane has now written so many platform-specific changes to her application that she would essentially need to rewrite the whole thing to go into the data center, which is where she started at from, from day one. So none of that's gonna work, and Jane is back to square one again. The problem now is, though, is that Jane has wasted so much time in trying to figure out where she's actually going to host her application and on top of which type of infrastructure she's going to build her application that she's run out of time. And the idea that she had, her competitors already re released the same product to market. So now Jane's really sad. There's no good ending to the story, by the way. So if you're waiting for a good ending, surprise. Um, so, so let's talk about this. I saw a lot of people kind of nodding their heads as I'm telling the story, and a lot of people, this, this seemed to resonate. So why do we have this complexity crisis? The reason we have this complexity crisis is because instead of thinking about the application first, we think about infrastructure first. And when you think about what brings business value and what brings value and, and money and all the other good things when we think about building an application, those, those thoughts need to start in the application, but they don't. So instead of starting in the middle of the stack or at the top of the stack, we start at the bottom of the stack and we let our infrastructure decisions dictate our application decisions. And that's wrong. That's, that's backwards. It's, it's not the right way to do things. But it's the way that we've been doing things for so long. Why? Well, I don't know. <laughs> a lot of times we just do things because that's the status quo, and so we continue to do things in the same way that we've always done them. So how could we solve for this? How could we build applications thinking about applications first? So what if we could build an application where we didn't care about the infrastructure? What if we could defer infrastructure decisions about where our application runs until runtime? What if we could get visibility into all of the bits that make up our application? So here's a question. Who here is familiar with all of the bits that are running on their system? Okay, one person, two people. That's what I thought. So when we build an application, 
we, can, we, we think about the bits that we care about, right? Because for most people, it's impossible to understand and to manage all of the bits on a running system, right? Everything that makes up the running system. So instead, we, care, we, we only focus on the bits that we care about. The problem is, is there, there's a lot of other things going on behind the scenes. And if you don't have visibility into everything else that's going on, it can come to bite you in the butt. So imagine if we had visibility into all the bits that make up our application. Uh, imagine if we had built-in topologies so that we wouldn't have to have additional tool chains to manage these, these topologies. Um, imagine if we had autonomous actors that would be able to respond to changes and that uh, didn't rely on orchestration. So imagine if we had applications that were capable of acting uh, in, in a choreographed type way as opposed to being orchestrated. You would actually gain, the, the larger your cluster grows, the more resilient it would become as opposed to the opposite. So the way we're doing things now is we're working in an orchestrated model and orchestration is built on top of systems and systems are fragile, right? So imagine if we didn't have to have that anymore. Uh, imagine if we could do all of this with legacy systems and with greenfield applications or legacy applications and greenfield applications. So imagine if we didn't have to rewrite everything from scratch to gain all of these things. Um, imagine if we had immutability with configurability. So imagine for a minute if we had containers that we could actually configure on the fly or configure at runtime, where you had immutable bits but an abstracted layer of configuration where you can configure the container at runtime. Well, that would be pretty cool. So let's do that. Well, the good news is, is that at Chef, we've done that, and we call it Habitat. So Habitat is, a, is the latest open source offering by Chef, and it allows, you, it allows you to build applications that basically take into consideration all of the things that I've talked about thus far. So Habitat will allow you to build uh, artifacts that you can use as artifacts that have essentially everything above the application built into it. So service discovery, uh, monitoring, and everything else that goes along when you think about, okay, now what else do I need when I have an application? That's all built in. So let's talk about that and let me introduce some of the components to Habitat and how it actually works. So Habitat has a couple of main components. First, it has a studio. The studio allows you to build Habitat artifacts and will also allow you to post-process and to export those artifacts into other systems, uh, Docker being one of them. So you can build a Habitat artifact and post-process it into a Docker container. And now you have a Docker container that give, that's running your application that's also running the Habitat supervisor that gives you all of the benefits of everything that I've just described inside of a Docker container. Um, also, the studio packages your application only with the bits that make up your application. So if you are using very specific versions of OpenSSL, GCLib, whatever you're using that your application is using, Habitat takes only those libraries as separate package dependencies and builds your application using those. So now you have visibility into all of the bits in, that make up your application. So you know everything that's running on your system. Uh, Habitat is composed of plans. So who here knows how to write a bash script? Raise your hands. Okay, so all of you that raise your hand, you know how to write Habitat because Habitat is simply bash. And what you do is you compose a plan.sh file, which is uh, what you then use in the studio to compose the artifact. It's very simple. So anybody that's written a bash script already knows how to write a Habitat artifact. Uh, we also give you the ability of configuration, and we give you the ability to write hooks. Uh, the, the hooks you can write in any language, and the hooks uh, is what the supervisor uses to respond to events. So as events uh, happen, the supervisor then will run the hooks written in whatever language you've chosen to write those hooks in to, again, respond to events. Uh, we also have a depot. Uh, the depot can be public, can be private. You can use multiple depots. Uh, it's basically where you store your software. And the depot works in a way that has channels. So you can have dev channels, QA channels, production channels to support continuous delivery. 
And then of course, there's the Habitat Supervisor. So the Habitat Supervisor is the intelligent runtime. It's, it's the thing that gives you all of the stuff that we've just been talking about. So at Chef, when we use the term application automation, the supervisor is what gives you this application automation. So you get deployment coordination, you get service discovery, you get automatic updates, and a whole lot more. And I'm gonna get into that in a minute. So all of these things come together and they produce a, uh, a Habitat artifact, which is a .heart file. And we would just like to remind you, as the DevOps community, that we at Chef call it a heart file because we love you very much. <laughs> so this is how you go from zero to Habitat. Um, there's a lot of words up here, but the, the gist is, is you open up uh, your studio, you construct a plan.sh. Now you see under point two, there's A through G. All you really need is you need to create an origin key and you need a plan.sh. So those are the only, the only two things that you need to create an artifact. All the rest of this stuff is just kind of extra gravy that you can use um, for additional application automation. So, um, yeah, once you do that, again, you have your Habitat artifact. That artifact can be executed using the Habitat binary. So you can say hab, and then just the same way you, you would run, say, a Docker container. Or you can take that Habitat artifact and export it into an ACI, a Docker container, and run it in the exact same way that you would run a Docker container. Docker, run, it, and then the name. So it works uh, pretty much in the exact same way. Um, we also have a build service that we're working on currently. We don't have the build service complete yet, but the build service will is essentially will be Habitat Studio in the cloud. And so it will allow you to build Habitat artifacts without having to have Habitat Studio on your machine. Um, Okay, so let's talk about the, the supervisor. So the, the supervisor arra arranges, arranges itself into a, sort of a peer-to-peer -peer network, a, a ring topology. And we use the gossip protocol for these um, inner communication between the supervisors. So what happens is, uh, is a supervisor will uh, detect an event and then will issue a rumor. And the other supervisors in the ring will then try to validate that rumor. And once the rumor has been validated, certain actions can then be taken based on the validation of that rumor. And again, the beauty of, of this architecture is that as your ring grows, your stability in your, in your systems grow because you have more supervisors that are able to respond to events, do elections, and all types of other things. Um, we ship with three topologies. We have a leader follower topology, we have initializer topology, and standalone topology. So think of these things as, uh, has anybody used Redis before? Has anybody used like Redis Sentinel to manage master slave and things like that? So, so th this is all kind of, this does all that for you and this is all built in. And you don't need to use it with Redis, you can use it with whatever platform you want. But the point is, it, is that these exist. Um, again, this is an open source uh, project and we very much welcome open source contribution. Uh, the platform is written in Rust, uh, so if anybody here is a Rust developer, I hear a woo, great. Um, so this would be a great opportunity. Uh, I think this is the biggest uh, Rust project to date, so this might be something that you'd be interested in. Um, and this is one area that we need some help in, in is the topologies. So. Uh, we think that we're cool with these three topologies, but we don't know for sure. And so we welcome your ideas and, and the dialogue to figure out what, what else we need. Um, when we build Habitat, we didn't build it all the way on purpose. So we, we, we built it half halfway. And the reason we did that is because we wanted to see how the community was going to actually use it and how you're going to respond. So instead of shipping out this big giant monolithic thing and saying, here's the thing, we wanted to come to you and say, like, here's our idea. Here's how we see things moving. Here's what we believe in as far as application automation goes. What do you guys think? And so we very much, we, we welcome your thoughts and your ideas on these topics. Um, a lot of security was uh, built into Habitat. Uh, we're using the Blake 2B crypto library. Uh, we are using um, asymmetric and symmetric keys, depending on which type of communication you're talking about. Um, 
Uh, we're using the Rust, implement, uh, Rust implementation of SALT. Um, and in addition to that, we also have update strategies. So uh, we currently have one update strategy, which is update at once. So imagine, if you will, that you never have to do updates on your applications again. The update strategies that we have allow automatic updating of your applications. So when you publish a new version to the depot, the supervisors sit there and, and they're listening and, and they're pinging the depot and they're saying, hey, what version do you have? Anything new, anything new, anything new? And if there is something new, then they will update themselves automatically. Now we have an, one additional update strategy that's currently under development, which is a rolling strategy. And we thought at, at Chef, when, we, when Habitat first came out, we thought, we're going to have a whole list of update strategies, right? Like, it's going to hit the community, and people are going to be like, well, we need this, and we need that. But the more that we began thinking about it, and the more that we started developing and working with this, the more we realized that we think we're good with the rolling um, and with the at once. So if you disagree, that's awesome, and we welcome your contribution. Um, but that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, so yeah, again, you can publish things to the depot. The supervisors automatically pick them up and then will automatically uh, update themselves. So that's Habitat in a nutshell. That's how it all comes together. So you use the Habitat Studio to write a plan. You compile the plan into an artifact. The artifact goes into a depot. You can take that artifact and post-process it into a Docker container if you like. And you can then run the artifact or the Docker container. Um, and then the supervisor essentially starts up alongside um, the container or the artifact, forms a ring, and now you've got a ring of supervisors that are all kind of watching and, and monitoring what's going on. So that's the approach. Um, immutability with configuration. Um, all of your tool chain components composed into uh, one supervisor. So uh, we eliminate the need now for having very complex tool chains. Um, and uh, again, uh, the really important thing to stress here is that this works the exact same way if with new applications and with uh, legacy applications. So, and when we say it works the same way with legacy applications, we don't mean cloud native. And those of you that are familiar with cloud native know that that's really a code word for rewrite everything. So that's not what we're talking about here. It's the exact same thing. You can take a binary that you have or source code that you have and compile it into an Habitat artifact in maybe an hour to an hour and a half, if, assuming you've never done it before. Um, and we do workshops and stuff all the time where we get together with people and we say, OK, what do you want to turn into an Habitat artifact? And usually within an hour to an hour and a half with an, uh, somebody who's never worked with it before, they have a working Habitat artifact. So. Uh, just to recap, and this is the part I'll read, Habitat provides application automation that enables modern application teams to build, deploy, and manage any application in any environment, from traditional data centers to, container, to containerized microservices. So you might be thinking, okay, well, doesn't blank do that? So uh, Docker, for instance. It's very important to understand that Habitat is not a container system. It's Habitat and Docker. Uh, you also have things like grid systems, like Mesos. Um, this is not that. You have a lot of tools that I'm sure that you're familiar with uh, by HashiCorp, which happens to be one of my favorite tooling companies out there. Um, we're big users and big supporters of HashiCorp at Chef. And, uh, but the idea of Habitat is to reduce your tool chain, not to, um, not to make your tool chain larger. Um, and again, we've talked about cloud native, so this isn't cloud native technology, AKA you don't have to rewrite everything from scratch. And a lot of times the questions I'll get from people are, well, this is crazy, uh, why do we need Chef? Okay, well, you still need systems to run your containers or your Habitat artifacts on top of. What, what Chef is and Puppet and systems like that are really good at, they're really good at managing infrastructure. They're not good at managing applications. So our idea for the ecosystem was to have Chef to manage um, your infrastructure automation and have Habitat as your application automation. So we believe that all applications can be automated across any platform. And again, I really want to stress that uh, this, this works, this is completely infrastructure independent. So you build your application and once you have your Habitat artifact, you can run it anywhere on any system. 
Normally at this time I would do a live demo, um, but that's a lie, and you'll have to actually wait for tomorrow for one of the open spaces where uh, I'll dig a little bit deeper into some of the core technology of into Habitat, and I'll do a bunch of demos for you uh, showing off the core features and functionality of Habitat. So um, if this has piqued your interest or your curiosity, then I w uh, invite you to come by tomorrow to the open space and to check it out. So. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to take, I've got like a minute to take questions. Uh, I can do that and also here's some links for you if you are interested in learning more about Habitat. So thank you. <laughs>